and welcome all to our second lesson, Human Performance and Limitations. Today we're going to talk about breeding, the good, bad and the broken, blood in our heart and g-forces. But first of all, we're going to begin with some exam tips. These are tips that don't fit into any particular category, but will be useful to know for your ATPL exams. So the first thing that I have put on this slide over here is to back or not to back. It's basically the questions that you will get about hyperventilation. If you can choose an answer that has a back in it, you should most of the times go for that answer. If the question, for example, is that you're flying with a student pilot and he's doing a maneuver and he did something wrong and now he's hyperventilating and you have a couple of answers to choose from, probably the most correct one would be to talk to him calmly and try to get him to talk calmly and to relax himself a little bit. So if you don't have a bag, try to relax the person. If there's a bag and a relaxation option, always go for the bag. All right, the second point we're going to talk about is humidity. Normally on ATPL exams, the humidity will be around 7 to 15 percent that they're going to talk about. The maximum of humidity that you will normally see on an ATPL exam is 25-ish percent. So just keep that in mind because there will be some questions. There are uh, multiple choice and you will have the option to say, oh, the aircraft has a very high humidity in certain parts of the world if you're flying over them, etc. So that's completely not true. It's only 7 to 15 percent. And even in the most advanced aircraft today, you will only get around 25 percent. There are also some tips about eat safe, drink safe, swim safe, and no ice. So for example, if you watch the video to our right, whenever they're talking about a tropical destination, just imagine this video to your right side. Would you go swim in this river? And if there was some fish in these crates over here, would you eat them? Would you clean your hands in here? Would you trust the tap water that's in here? Or would you, for example, get a can of coca-cola or fanta or whatever and get some ice cubes that are probably from the same river or the same tap water that they have over here stay safe and always think about this when they're asking you about a tropical destination motivation also affects the direction and intensity of a person's behavior that's also something that you should remember um, it's something that you will get in a couple of questions on the ATPL exam. So you might be lucky to get a few of those. So just remember this one sentence. So if you're basically motivated to do something and you're very motivated, you will see it in the actions of the person. All right. So welcome to the anatomy of the respiratory system. So before we do a deep dive into that, I'm just going to say, I'm an emergency nurse myself. I worked on an ambulance for many years. I've worked in hospitals. So I can really deep dive into these subjects. Now, what you should know is that most people that do their EASA ATPL, English isn't their primary language. It's most of the second or the third or the fourth language that they speak. So there's no point in me deep diving and doing really fancy with all the words because nobody would understand it. So we're going to do it on a basic level right now. And we'll throw in the fancy stuff that you need to know for your ATPL exams. And I'll later tell you uh, basically what it means. So things you should remember. And then after we're going to speak about what it actually means. All right. So the respiratory system consists of several vital structures responsible for the exchange of gases between body and the environment. So we have the air around us and we have our body over here. Nasal cavity and mouth. So we got a few ways for air to enter. So we got our mouth over here and we got our nose over here. Air enters the respiratory system through the nasal cavity or the mouth where it's warmed, humidified and filtered before reaching the lungs. So especially if we go through the nose, we got our nose here, it's always a little wet. So all the dirt basically gets stuck in here. Our air goes a little bit more down and then we enter the pharynx or the throat and it serves as a passageway for food and air. The larynx or voice box contains the vocal cords and plays a crucial role in speech production 
and protecting the airway during swallowing. So basically, that's the part we're going to have over here. The trachea, also known as a windpipe, is a tube composed of a cartilage rings that carries air from the larynx to the bronchi. So here are the rings, and here we have our bronchi. The trachea divides into two bronchi, which further branch into smaller airways called bronchioles. These structures transport air deep into the lungs. So we got our two bronchi, they divide further, just like all these little blue ones you got on the screen over here. And at the end of the bronchioli are clusters of tiny air sacs called alveoli. These sacs are surrounded by capillaries in the primary sites of gas exchange, where oxygen enters the bloodstream and carbon dioxide is removed. So we got little sacs over here called alveolis, and basically they're all over the place. And what they do is they get the oxygen that just entered the lungs and they replace it and the CO2 moves out. So that's if everything's working fine. That's basically what happens inside your lungs and it moves back out. Great. Breathing is facilitated by a diaphragm. A dome-shaped muscle located belong, below the lungs and the intercostal muscles between the ribs. Okay, so we got a big diaphragm over here, basically. What is between your stomach area and your heart to your lungs. And then you got your intercostal muscles, which basically have your ribs over here. And the intercostal is basically the space between those ribs. And there are muscles in there. And those muscles also move together with the diaphragm to make sure we can breathe. Contraction and relaxation of these muscles creates changes in lung volume, allowing air to be drawn into and expelled from the lungs. So basically what I just said. So how do we actually breathe? During inspiration, the diaphragm contracts. So this part, if it contracts, it will descent, creating a negative pressure which allows air to be sucked in. And the external intercostal muscles elevate the rib cage. So these bad boys over here, they are going to give us more room for the air to come in. So basically your chest is going to move up. If you take a big breath right now, you will feel that your whole muscle groups and your whole chest is going to move forward. It's making more room for the air. This action expands the thoracic cavity, reducing intertrachoid pressure and causing airflow into the lungs via the airways. All right. Conversely, during expiration, the diaphragm relaxes, so basically moves back into place. And the intercostal muscles relax, allowing the ribcage to lower. This reduces the volume of the thoracic cavity, increasing intertoracic pressure and facilitating the expulsion of air from the lungs. So basically, everything gets pushed out once we relax again. Alright, so now that we watched our beautiful presentation about the respiratory system, we're going to quickly jump towards the alveoli. Because within the alveoli, oxygen diffuses into the bloodstream, while carbon dioxide moves from the blood into the alveoli for exhalation, basically to breathe it out. This fundamental process sustains life by ensuring oxygenation and carbon dioxide removal. The partial pressure of oxygen in the air is around 160. Remember, this is at sea level. In the alveoli, it is around 103. The oxygen pressure in the venous blood is around 40. This is where Dalton's law that you learned last lesson comes into play. It is important to remember that the partial pressure of oxygen is around 60 millimeters at 10,000 feet. The higher we go, 
the lower the partial pressure becomes. At certain altitudes, you need supplemental oxygen. But if we go even higher, supplemental oxygen itself won't be enough. We will need positive pressure to force the air into the lungs. In a healthy individual, the level of carbon dioxide in the bloodstream determines the breathing rate, not the oxygen level. All right, if you're still with us, congratulations. Your motivation and dedication is really signing through. Maybe it will demise a little bit after this one slide. So feel free to watch it a couple of times again. Take a screenshot, write some things down because this is going to be important if you get a couple of questions about lungs on your exam. So we're going to talk about the tidal volumes and the vital capacity. We're going to start at the left top of this picture and we're just going to work our way across it. Inspiratory reserve volume refers to the additional volume of air that can be forcefully inhaled beyond a normal tidal volume inhalation. All right, so it's basically the maximum amount of air that can be inspired after a normal inspiration. Tidal volume is the volume of air that is exchanged during normal breathing, both during inhalation and exhalation. It represents the amount of air moved into or out the lungs with each breath. Expiratory reserve volume refers to the additional volume of air that can be forcefully exhaled beyond a normal tidal volume exhalation. It represents the maximum amount of air that can be expired after a normal expiration. Residual volume is the volume of air that remains in the lungs after maximal exhalation. It represents the air that cannot be expelled from the lungs even with maximal effort and serves to maintain lung and airway patency. So basically that it doesn't stick to each other and it remains in shape. Inspiratory capacity is the maximum amount of air that can be inspired after a normal tidal volume expiration. It is calculated as the sum of the tidal volume and inspiratory reserve volume. Functional residual capacity is the volume of air remaining in the lungs after a normal tidal volume expiration. It represents the equilibrium point between the inward elastic recoil of the lungs and the outward recoil of the chest wall. It is the sum of the expiratory reserves and a residual volume. Vital capacity is the maximum amount of air that can be exhaled after a maximal inhalation. It is the sum of tidal volume, inspiratory reserve volume and expiratory reserve volume. This is also the test you normally do as a class one uh, medical pilot. Total lung capacity is the total volume of air contained in the lungs at a maximal inflation. It is the sum of all lung volumes, including tidal volume, inspiratory reserve volume, expiratory reserve volume, and residual volume. Understanding these terms in assessing lung function and respiratory mechanics in various physiological and pathological conditions. These lung capacities play a crucial role in maintaining efficient gas and respiratory functioning. So basically, just remember what they all stand for and what they actually mean and how you can calculate what each of them means. So this picture that I found is basically really encompassing because you can see all the colors. So that's why I say probably make a picture of it or take a screenshot or whatever, because it's really easy to see all the colors in the lungs and see all the colors that correspond with it down below. All right, great, you survived our last slide. That's awesome. We're now gonna talk about hypoxia and the types of hypoxia there are and that you need to know of as a pilot. Important thing to know, everything with hypo is basically that you don't have enough of it. If it's with sugar, if it's with oxygen, just remember hypo, you have too low amount of it, hyper, you have too much. So hypoxia and the types. 
We're going to start with hypoxic hypoxia. It occurs at high altitudes where reduced oxygen availability, because of the partial pressure, leads to symptoms like confusion and impaired judgment. Or if you're high enough, you just got a few seconds and you will be gone. Anemic hypoxia arises from the decreased oxygen carrying capacity due to conditions like anemia, resulting into fatigue and increased alertness. So basically shortness of red blood cells, for example. Stagnant hypoxia caused by the reduced blood flow to the tissue during G-force maneuvers, resulting in symptoms like tunnel vision and impaired coordination. Histotoxic hypoxia results of the inability of cells to utilize oxygen effectively, often due to toxins, leading to symptoms like headache and nausea. So this can probably be something like uh, carbon monoxide poisoning or stuff like that. All right. All right. I'm glad you're still alive after that last slide and I hope I didn't turn you off flying yet because being an airline traffic pilot is probably been your dream all day. So don't let this one presentation ruin it all for you. <laughs> We're going to talk about the states of oxygen saturation. So basically between the altitude of zero and 10,000, there's nothing special. At about 10,000 to 30,700, you would probably like some supplemental oxygen, especially uh, comparing the different laws that we have in Europe compared to America um, and what type of flying you're doing. Are you just doing private flying? Are you going to do jet flying? Are you going to go to the airlines? Are you a passenger? Are you a required crew member? Basically means uh, if you have to use oxygen or you don't and the amount of time you're going to be up there. Um, I'm going to make one big separate video about all those different laws. Um, from time to time, they also change. Uh, for example, at some airlines, if you're above a certain altitude and one of the two pilots needs to go to the toilet, you're required to put on your oxygen mask. Now, of course, almost nobody does it, but just know that in some airlines and some countries and some regions of the world, it is a law. At 10,000 to 30,700, you won't need to supplement oxygen plus the air. When we get a little bit higher, we need 100% oxygen with an approved mask. So what is an approved mask? Basically what it means is, if you have one of those really shitty AliExpress masks, it's not going to work because at this altitude, oxygen is not really the problem. It's the fact that the partial pressure is so low that there isn't any exchange happening in our lungs. So that's why at the moment we go above 40,000 feet, we need it to be under pressure. Because without the pressure, even if we get 100% of oxygen, nothing is going to happen. One quick thing that didn't really fit into any of these is the cabin pressurization that we're going to shortly talk about before jumping into the common illnesses. So a pressurized airplane, most cabins are currently set to approximately six to 8,000 feet. So even if you're at 40,000 feet or 30,000 feet, most of the time you will be around six to 8,000 um, inside the pressure of the aircraft when it's pressurized. This adjustment is basically for passenger comfort as well as the physiological function of us humans, because otherwise with the partial pressure and everything, we won't be able to breathe. So remember six to 8,000, so 6,000 to 8,000 for the cabin pressurization. Now we're here at the common illnesses that affect breathing. So I've got a whole list over here. I'm just going to quickly talk about them. We're going to start with asthma. Asthma is a chronic inflammatory condition of the airways characterized by episodes of reversible airflow obstruction and airway hyperresponsiveness. In individuals with asthma, the airway becomes inflamed and narrowed in response to various triggers, leading to symptoms such as wheezing, coughing, shortness of breath, and chest tightness. These symptoms can range from mild to severe and may be triggered by allergens, respiratory infections, exercise, stress, or exposure to irritants. 
Treatments typically involve medication to reduce inflammation and bronchodilators to relieve the symptoms and improve the airflow. So basically what a bronchodilator is, is basically opening everything back up because everything is constrained, everything is um, getting shrunken inside and basically bronchodilators open everything back up. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD. Is a progressive lung disease characterized by chronic airflow limitations due to inflammation and damage to the airways and alveoli. The two main forms of COPD are chronic bronchitis, emphysema. Chronic bronchitis involves inflammation and narrowing of the airways, leading to coughing and excessive mucus production, so basically slime. Emphysema involves damage to the uh, alveoli resulting in reduced gas exchange and airflow limitations. Common symptoms of COPD include chronic cough, sputum production, shortness of breath, and reduced exercise tolerance. Smoking is the primary cause of COPD, although other factors such as air pollution and occupational exposure to dust or chemicals can also contribute to the development. Pneumonia is an infection to functional tissue of the lungs caused by bacteria, viruses, fungi, which is basically mold, or other pathogens. It leads to inflammation and fluid accumulation within the alveoli, impairing gas exchange. Pneumonia can present with symptoms such as fever, cough, chest pain, difficulty breathing, and sputum production. The severity of pneumonia can vary with mild to life-threatening, depending on the underlying cause of the individual's overall health. Treatment typically involves antibiotics for bacterial pneumonia and supportive care for the viral pneumonia. A little refreshing water with all the talking that we're doing here. All right, the next one is going to be pulmonary embolism. It occurs when a blood clot, usually from deep veins of the legs. So, for example, if you're sitting on a long haul flight and you aren't moving a lot, or if you've broken a leg and you need to be in a cast for around two weeks and you're not putting in the little syringes that they're giving you. Um, to make sure the blood doesn't clog into your arteries, then this is something you can get. This obstruction can lead to reduced oxygenation of the blood and potentially life-threatening complications such as right heart strength or failure. Symptoms of pulmonary embolism may include sudden onset of chest pain, shortness of breath, rapid breathing, coughing up blood and dizziness. Prompt diagnosis and treatment are essential to prevent further complications. All right, now we're gonna jump to lung cancer. Is a malignant, uh, malignant tumor that originates in the cell of the lung tissue. It is often associated with long-term smoking, although long-term smoking can also develop lung cancer due to other risk factors, such as exposure to radon, asbestos, or air pollution. Lung cancer can present with symptoms such as persistent coughs, chest pain, coughing up blood, weight loss, and difficulty of breathing. Early detection and treatments offer the best chance of successful outcomes. Interstitial lung disease encompasses a group of disorders characterized by inflammation and scarring of the lung tissue, affecting the interstitium. This is basically the space between the air sacs. Examples of ILDs include idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, IPF, uh, sacrodiosis, and hypersensitivity pneumatitis. ILDs can lead to symptoms such as shortness of breath, cough, fatigue, and reduced exercise tolerance. The progression of prognosis of ILD vary depending on the specific condition of individual factors. Tuberculosis is a bacterial infection caused by Mycobacterium tuberculosis. It has primarily affected the lungs, but it can also involve other organs. Tuberculosis is transmitted through the air via respiratory droplets and can be latent or active. Active tuberculosis can present with symptoms such as persistent cough, 
fever, mild sweats, weight loss, and chest pain. Treatment typically involves a combination of antibiotics taken over several months. Untreated tuberculosis can lead to serious complications and might be life-threatening. So that was a lot to swallow at once, and I do realize it's taking a long time. Um, but these are the things that you should know about as a pilot. You shouldn't know each of the sicknesses by heart or remember them from all of your life. But just know what they look like, for which one you're gonna watch out for, and that all of these people have a higher chance of barotrauma um, problems um, compared to a more healthy individual. Alright, welcome to the heart and the blood, glad you're still here. So this is going to be a very short um, part of the heart that we're going to talk about. Because there are not many questions about it, and you probably learn about it in school a lot more, so this is just going to be a quick recap. And I'm going to probably make a video of it uh, sometime later, talking about heart diseases uh, and in-flight emergencies that can happen. So I just drew two lines over here. So basically, this is the return flow back to our heart. It goes into the right atrium, then it goes to the right ventricle. On this side, we basically have blood that has more CO2 and less oxygen because it just passed through all of your body. And now something interesting happens because when it goes from the right ventricle, it goes into the pulmonary artery. One thing that you should know is that the pulmonary artery is the only artery in your body that has uh, blood that is not oxygen rich. That's very important to know. You might get a couple of questions. Uh, on the question banks that uh, um, ask this in different types of way. So basically all the arteries in your body are rich of oxygen but not the pulmonary artery because it only goes from the heart with, from, the, uh, from the blood that has just returned from the whole body and goes towards the lungs. So that's an important part. Now the other way around it is also important to know that the pulmonary vein actually carries the rich oxygenated blood from the lungs to the left atrium to the left ventricle and from the left ventricle it goes whoops, to your aorta and goes all over the body to give rich blood so remember these two that they're basically the other way around of all the rest in the body all right, so welcome to the blood pressure regulation part. So the REST system is basically the main responsible factor for your blood pressure. It has a lot of different ways to get the blood pressure up and also to get it back down. Now, in most cases, this is gonna be the system that's gonna take care of the blood pressure. Now, if you get a jump scare or for every reason um, you, your, your body jumps, it's going to be a different way. But for your exams, you just need to know this, basically. Feel free to take a screenshot of this. Now, as a pilot, I don't believe that you uh, need to know everything of how this works. So this is already a deep dive. Um, I'll make some deep dive videos on organs like the heart and how this system works. It will probably be interconnected with the REST system because basically the, the body is holistic, right? It's not just one body part, everything works together. That's also what you can see because we're just talking about blood pressure. We got a liver, we got a kidneys, we got the lungs, we got everything over here. So that's why it is just important that you know how it works. So basically what happens is for example, blood goes towards the kidney, and in the kidney, the blood normally, uh, well, at least the moisture gets filtered. There are a couple of active ways, there are a couple of passive ways um, that water gets sent back into the bloodstream. But as soon as the kidney senses that it's not filtering enough, basically what it means is that your blood pressure is too low. So it's going to activate this whole system. And this whole system, what it's going to do is it's going to give reabsorption of salt and when you have salt a water follows passively so that's basically what's happening in the kidney it is giving salt back to the blood and the water is just following the salt so if we have more water in our bloodstream we have more volume now if we have a vessel and we have vasoconstriction so we're constricting the space that the blood has then the blood pressure will go up very fast. 
So basically that's all you need to remember from this system. Take a screenshot from this and if there are any questions in the future um, about it, I will make a video of it separately and I'll throw in the questions on the ATBL bank that I see that uh, come on this particular subject. All right, so now we're getting close towards the end. We're gonna talk about the types of acceleration that we have. We have linear acceleration, involves change in speed or velocity in a straight line. It is experienced during takeoff, landing, and changes in flight speed. The duration of an acceleration is also important to know. Please remember these terms. Long-term acceleration is everything that takes longer than one second. So it isn't really that long. Short-term acceleration is everything that's less than a second. Remember those. All right, welcome to our next bit in G-forces. 1G is what we normally experience in Earth. Two, vision is affected while returning our few seconds. Your face will sag. 2.5 Gs becomes harder to sit back upright. So if you want to sit a little bit more upright, it's becoming harder to do that. 3 Gs, impossible to raise yourself from a sitting posture. 3.5 Gs, gray out of vision occurs. Of course, when you get out of the maneuver and the Gs relax after a few seconds, you will be back. 4.5 Gs, complete loss of vision. Vision returns a few seconds. 5 to 6 Gs, loss of consciousness. 7 Gs, apart reaching movements are impossible. So for example, if you need to reach the overhead panel, you won't be able to reach it. 8 Gs, movement of limbs are impossible without support. So you would need some kind of support like armrest or whatever to even move your arm. All right, now, as you can see, those were only the positive G forces. It is, however, good to know that there are also negative G-forces. Negative G-forces, or the forces that push you out of your seat, can cause blood rush away from the head, leading to effects such as increased blood flow to the eyes um, that can result into a reddish appearance of vision caused by congestion in blood vessels of the eye. You can also get a cornea rupture, which is basically the excessive g-forces that can um, destroy your corneal uh, structure uh, by a rupture because of the increased pressure that you will have in your eye. All right, so since you stuck around for such a long time, um, I am gonna quickly talk about extra exam tips. So on a lot of ATPL exam questions, what you will get is that there's a scenario, you're in a tropical country, um, you see lovely grapes, you buy them off this lovely lady, she's so sweet, you eat them, the next day you're uh, in bed, you have to run to the toilet all the time, you can't go anywhere, um, diarrhea is uh, shooting out everywhere. Um, it's because potentially there was feces um, on the fruit itself, because fruit you just eat it, right? It's, it's not getting cooked and nothing is done with it. And if you go to some countries where the hygiene is less or they don't have good flowing water, there might be some feces uh, on your fruit. So just remember, whenever you see fruit, think of our little smiley third over here and um, it will probably save you a point. Internal respiration is a metabolic process that takes place inside the cells during which oxygen is used and carbon dioxide is produced. Just remember this one sentence uh, for some foreign pilots, it might be um, hard to remember, but this is just one sentence that you need to know of. It's in a couple of ATPL questions about the lungs. All right, so this brings us to the first question. What is the correct procedure of avoiding infection in tropical climates? Now, this time I'm actually not gonna give the answer. I'm gonna let you guys comment uh, down below and I'll look at what your uh, guys' responses are. I'm very curious. Select the factor which may cause hyperventilation. 
So again, whatever you think is the correct one, just drop it down below and I'll, uh, I'll after a few guys have commented, I'll probably give you the, the right answers to them. Um, but I'm very curious uh, what you guys will select. All right, I thank you all for sticking around in this video for so long. It's been a long video. I see it's around 36 minutes. So normally I aim for 15 to 20, but these subjects were really long and I didn't get to really talk in depth of them um, as much as I wanted to, but I'll make a separate video uh, for um, the, the heart and the rest system because it just intertwines and it's going to be a real deep dive. Um, you won't probably need it as a pilot, but if you just feel like you want to know it, then, um, then at least you can on my YouTube channel. Um, I feel like what we have covered today is going to be enough for your ATPL exams. Now, if there are any additions or questions that you might have, please comment down below. This is only my second video, so I'm still kind of feeling and learning on how um, I can best approach it. But I hope you enjoyed the response of the first video. We're all amazing. Thank you all for the positive responses. And I hope to see you soon in lesson three. Thank you very much. Have a great day.